So I wanted to share a little story or a fable with you. There once was a man who worked very hard. In fact, maybe too hard. He was always busy trying to solve the problems of the world, fix everything that was broken around him, care for his family, be an outstanding citizen. And he worked day after day after day after day. And he had a son. He had a young son, let's say for the sake of today's story that he was seven, this little boy. And one day, like many days, he went in to see his father and his father was sitting at his desk and he was stressed and he was overcome with what was happening in the world around him. He was a good person who wanted to do something to make the world a better place. And his little boy said to him, Daddy, 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 can we play? And his father said, ah, I'm busy. There's so much happening in the world. I am so busy. And his, daddy, his little boy said, Daddy, when can we play a game? His father said, you, you know what? You want a game here. And he had on his desk a picture of the world, his father, this man did. And he took this picture of the world, and he ripped it up into pieces, and he said, I'm going to give you this puzzle. And when you put this puzzle together, when you come back, we'll go outside and we'll play. We'll play in the sprinklers because it's really hot. And he thought, Phew, OK, I just bought myself several hours, if at all. There's no way this child can figure this out. Well, 15 minutes later, the seven-year-old boy <laughs> brought back the puzzle, taped together perfectly. And his father said, how did you do that? That was a picture of the whole world. And the boy looked at it, and he said, Dad, if you turn it over, there's a picture of a man. And it was easy to put that man back together. That story <laughs> gets me every time I hear it and think about it. Not because there's anything unusual with being overwhelmed or working hard or feeling concerned about the state of the world, but because I can lose my grounding, I can go over that tipping point where the harder I work, the less helpful I am. Where the more distraught I am, the less good I am offering the world. And what I've learned over the years is that there is a place and a time on a regular basis that when I reach those points, I need to stop and look within. Turn over the world and look at that person that is me and find out what puzzle piece is out of place. Look and see what needs to be put back together again. And maybe who can help me do that? Because often it's not alone. So I've been waiting a long time to offer this, this reflection, and it seemed fitting for a summer service, a little less formal, a little more open. And it's about something I call gnats which when I am in a position that I learn I need to turn that world over and look at that self, it's usually the gnats that are getting me. And it's always the gnats that can actually lead me back to peace. It is ironic. When I am the most overwhelmed, it is not the biggest things that I need to solve about myself. It is often very small. 
Wendell Berry writes, and many of you know these words well, when despair for the world grows in me, and I wake in the night at the least sound in fear of what my life and my children's lives may be, I go and lie down where the wood drake rests in his beauty on the water and the great heron feeds. I come into the peace of wild things who do not tax their lives with forethought of grief. I come into the presence of still water and I feel above me the day blind stars waiting with their light for a time I rest in the grace of the world and am free. Who among us doesn't feel the need to be free sometimes? And who among us isn't overcome with grief, rage, and despair about things in our own lives and the state of the world at times? I haven't actually been with you on a Sunday worship service since the Supreme Court's decision overturning Roe v. Wade. <laughs> Though I was with some of you in the streets the day after the decision came down. And that was a day I will remember always. It was profound. That's not what this sermon is about, though I imagine I'll give that sermon someday. But the rage in my body. And so when a grandmother, as she self-described, said, let's get in the middle of the street, let's get in the middle of the street, and someone said, that's called civil disobedience. <laughs> Over 200 people got in the middle of the street. And I'm sorry I said I wasn't going to do this. I'll just, you're here, so I'll just do this and go back. When the man from Maine pulled up in his big something car, Land Rover, I don't know, and couldn't go any further, because we were several hundred people in the middle of the streets, and he turned the car a bit, and many of us thought, OK, what's going to happen? And he got out, and he threw his keys on the ground, and he walked over, and he picked up a sign, <laughs> and he held it in the air. When I turned this way to this side of the, we were up on um, High Street, when, we, when I turned this way and I saw the police cars coming, I thought to myself, and only you will know this, for a moment, oh God, <laughs> what's somebody going to do about that? And then I went, oh God, <laughs> that's me. I need to do something about that. So I walked up ready to explain what was happening and defend our rights. We had no permit. We didn't plan to stand in the middle of the street. And I walked up and I said, officer, we're doing this for 19 minutes. We only have a few more minutes left. He said, it's fine. It's fine. I'm just, change I'm just diverting traffic. We just want traffic to go that way. Take all the time you need. Take all the time you need. Thank you, Newburyport Police. That was quite the day. So I haven't been with you since then. Who doesn't worry about their children or the children in this world? Grandchildren, the plant and the animal kingdoms of this beloved earth, who doesn't worry? I know who I do. And it is one of the primary reasons that our annual ministry theme for this coming year in September is peace. We need peace in this world. We need peace within ourselves, which is an essential part of realizing peace on earth. You can't have one without the other. We cannot achieve peace in this world if we are harbingers and carriers of hatred and anger and anxiety and fear and vitriol all the time. So too, if we are completely at peace and removed from the world, the world isn't going to have peace. 
So like the poet, Wendell Berry, I turn to nature as a source of solace and inspiration when times are tough. And I know many of you join me in that practice. It's not the only thing I turn to, however. I turn to relationship, because when I am cut off or isolated, despair will overtake me. I turn to community, because none of this can be done alone. I turn to the divine, that source of peace. And I sweep the kitchen floor. I am very serious about it. With all that's going on in the world, and all you need to do, and everything you're stressed out about, my husband says to me, why are you sweeping the floor? I just am, I say. It helps me. And it does. Truth be told, sweeping the kitchen floor is one of my spiritual practices. It is the last thing I do every night before turning toward bedtime. So how does dealing with crumbs help my feelings of overwhelm? How can procuring small pieces of vegetables that drop to the floor while I was preparing dinner make me feel somehow better? If you mix in some dog hairs from my beloved Charlotte and dirt from our walk that day, I am completely at peace. <laughs> Even for a moment, there's something about picking up everything that is broken, putting it in its place, and throwing it in the trash. So I've come to understand that it is the subtleties in life that most reliably soothe my soul's soul. It's the subtleties, it's the little things that allow my nervous system to settle. The movement of the sheer curtains in the summer breeze, the way lavender smells if I put my face close to its delicate <clears throat> blossom, the memory the company is finding my grown child's stuffed animal from when they were 10 in the basement. Yes, I am the wooden flute dreamer and the early morning prayer. The single blossom in a small glass jar. The light on a clear desktop with one hymnal resting in its corner. It is to those things I return again and again with no offense to anyone and all of you who find equal measure of returning to peace in rock bands. People I love turn to that kind of music. Or neighborhood parties going well into the night. That is my daughter. Or large crystal vases overflowing with peony blossoms. All of those things are wonderful. The question is, what is it that soothes your soul? We can appreciate many diverse things, of course, but, but push yourself a little harder for this truth. What returns you to your centered, non-reactive, cool-headed, open-hearted self? We are not designed to live in a perpetual state of overdrive and overwhelm. We must find ways to return, to center, and to restore. As I've said, it is the subtleties in life that help me to return, perhaps because my personality and my drive are inclined to go towards bigger things, like marching in the streets. I want answers. I see solutions. I see patterns and possibilities. And all of those things are good in right measure. But my soul knows my tendency to lean toward the big. Thus, she calls me back to the small, the subtle, the simple. She's never loud, always present 
and always forgiving. It's not surprising then that some of my greatest insights and personal understandings have also come from addressing the deceptively small things in life that challenge me. So if it is the small things that bring me peace, it is often the smallest things that will offer me the greatest freedom. One of the many gifts of being in recovery for me is that I have a few people who know me inside and out. And one of them is a dear friend who I talk with every Friday morning before work. It is that 8 a.m. Friday meeting that I refer to for those of you who've tried to schedule a meeting with me at 8 a.m. on Fridays. I cherish that conversation, and I only change it when absolutely necessary. And there are many, if not most, Fridays that I get on that phone, and I have plenty to talk about. We get on the phone, and I start talking, and an hour is gone before I know it. My friend listens offers me her insights, helps me gain clarity on how I may want to respond to some of the biggest things in my life. Her friendship has warded off many an unnecessary disagreement or holding of a grudge in my life. There was one illustrious Friday morning several years ago, however, when I found I had no big problems to talk with her about. I, this had not happened in about seven years. I don't know what to say, I said, and stumbled over my words. Her name happens to be Rebecca, and she laughed and replied and said, talk to me about the gnats. I said, the what? She said, the gnats, the little things that you think aren't really bothering you. I pulled my head back from the phone and I said, well, you don't mean like and I won't tell you, but I filled in the blank. And she said, yes, that. Let's talk about that. And so it began. I realized that these seemingly insignificant things, small annoyances with a colleague, tiny frustrations with my partner, the words spoken by someone to which I was certainly being too sensitive, the little subtle things offered me the world if I would take the time to explore them. The annoyance that unaddressed would have surely grown into a grievance and a big story. It held opportunities for new ideas, if I could share it with respect. That tiny frustration that could have led to serious arguments or worse, that I actually could laugh at and feel my heart open again. Those words that hurt, that when taking a moment with them led to a place of hurt unresolved from my past, decades ago. A place that love between friends and within myself could heal, even after so many years. Unlike the things that soothe us, which can be large or small in designs, gnats, as I call them, when unacknowledged, have the potential to eat away at us, like microaggressions. You may have those based on something about who you are. It's not only race, physical ability, ethnic culture, sex, sexual orientation, age, learning style, and those microaggressions. Or hurtful family patterns that are so funny, but aren't. And it's one incident isn't so terribly horrible. And so we turn from it. We may think it's silly or even ridiculous to address it. But what if it's not? What if it could be a doorway into deeper understanding or compassion or bravery? What if by addressing it, we can change things before they become so ingrained or humongous that it feels too late? How is it that by changing the way, for example, my true confession, how is it that by changing the way I use my electric toothbrush, 
I've changed my whole orientation to my days. So my dentist said, you just, you just hold it on a tooth. You don't like move the toothbrush. And I was like, oh, okay, okay. And I'd put that toothbrush in my mouth and I'd start moving it because I couldn't stop and just hold the toothbrush on a tooth and then the next tooth. And so over a period of time, I realized I don't, I do everything that way. It's not just a toothbrush. I realized how fast I am prone to be regardless. So how is it that dealing with one niggling question can clear up years of confusion in a relationship? Now, none of us have the time to address all the gnats. It wouldn't be helpful if we did. I imagine it would be excruciating. There's a balance, like in all of life. Physician and author Rachel Naomi Remen suggests a practice to doctors when they're burned out. She encourages them to take a few minutes at the end of every day and acknowledge three things. One is something that moved them that day. The second is something that inspired them. And the third is something that touched them. Now, many of these doctors discard this suggestion. They think it's silly or a cliche. But she writes that those who do it find themselves restored. They become awakened and present to life in ways they didn't even know they lost. Exploring our gnats in the challenges or the positive is not the same as gossiping or venting or bemoaning. When it's a challenge, it's actually an opportunity for an exploration of ourself. It asks us to be open-minded, curious, willing to assume responsibility for our part in the situations. Does the gnat remind us of the scabs in our heart or represent a larger fear or resentment? Is it a stand-in for Uncle Donald or carrier of toxic shame? It helps to have someone to talk to about these things, someone who understands your motive and purpose in speaking of them. But that can even be a journal or a conversation with parts of yourself. My friends, when the world is overwhelming and we lose touch with our best self, when we cannot find the place of rest within us and our hearts feel nearly sealed, closed, may we take the time to step back, address the little things, and experience the sublime in the subtleties of this day. May we turn over the puzzle of the larger world just for a time and focus on the pieces of ourselves that need tending. May we recognize when our sights have lost proportions, and may we humbly return to our hearts with grace. And then, may we sweep the kitchen floor, take a walk to the beach, sing to our favorite rock band. Amen and blessed be.